long, long ago, two titans were locked in an eternal battle. Until... they stopped. And then life began to grow on their bodies, and then they were locked in an eternal battle. On the Mechonis lived the Mechons, who are like your average robots, except that they eat people. And on the Bionis lived the Homs, basically just humans, but with a cooler fantasy sounding name. And the strongest Hom is a man named Dumban, who leads the Mechon Resistance alongside his best friends, Skinny Hulk Hogan, aka Dixon, and Mumkar, who was voted most likely to betray his comrades in high school. Dumban's signature weapon is called the Monado. It's super important to the Homs due to it being the only weapon that can effectively destroy Mechons, with its only flaw being that if you aren't the chosen one, it kinda kills you. Dunban isn't the chosen one, but he's so much of a chad that he just kind of brushes it off. During a pinnacle battle between the Homs and the Mechon, we see that Dunban gets unexpectedly betrayed by Mumkar, who ends up getting eaten by the Mechons. With no options remaining, Dunban and Dixon charge at the Mechons for a last ditch effort to push them back. Time skip time... skip. A year passes and we're now met with our actual protagonist, Shulk. Pronounced Shulk who lives in Colony 9 together with his best friend and his childhood love interest. You can decide which is which. Wee woo wee woo. The Mechons are invading again, which is extra bad because only the Monado can destroy them, and only Dunban can wield the Monado. And Dunban has developed severe arthritis from his injuries. So Shulk picks up the Monado and whoa, he can see into the future, giving him the chance to change destiny. <sighs> Is he the chosen one? Says Dumban. I'm really feeling this victory, guys, says Shulk. Let's go! Says Ryan. But then an even bigger Mechon appears, and this one has a face. Which means it's an important character to the plot, and we can't beat it up just yet. But apparently, Fiora doesn't read the script, and rides in on a forklift like, Alright guys, time to attack this thing head on! And gets totally ultra-owned by the Mechon, who take off with her corpse. The next day, everyone is still sad, and Shulk's like, There's two voices in my head, and one is telling me to make them pay! <laughs> and Ryan's like, Are you sure that ain't my voice in there, bud? But you can't hear any of it because the music's so freaking loud! So Shulk and Ryan embark on their quest to destroy the faced Mechon, while Dunban stays behind and takes his arthritis pills or whatever. But wait just one second, did you know that this game has side quests? Not 10, not 50, over 400 side quests! <gasps> Woo! and 90% of them follow the same format of, Hey, I was just taking a walk the other day, and can you believe it? There was a bunny right there, standing in the road. Can you go kill, uh, a hundred of them? And that pretty much takes up most of your time spent playing this game. On the other side of a cave, the boys reach Gar Plains, based on that one stage from Super Smash Bros. And it's at this point that the game starts throwing a bunch of insanely overleveled super bosses out into the open world. And they all have super threatening names like, Immovable Gonzalez, Graceful Ricardo, and Gentle Rodriguez. Basically, if you get within 10 yards of them, you're probably dead. But at least you get to listen to that sick, sick music. Shulk and Ryan end up saving a kid named Juju, who takes them to see his hot sister, who reveals that their colony was attacked and destroyed by Mechons. Shulk suddenly has a future vision where he sees Juju getting totally wrecked by a Mechon, and is like, Maybe I should tell them about this? Nah. Then Juju runs off to go defend his colony all by himself, and the crew has to chase after him. They eventually find him getting attacked by a Mechon, but this one also has a face. And it can't be damaged by the Monado. And it can speak. Hey. And Shulk's like, What's going on here? My Monado is supposed to destroy everything that isn't human, but it can't kill these faced Mechon, but it can destroy everything that isn't human, but it can't kill these faced Mechon. But the faced Mechon can't really kill them either, so it's just like, Alright, just fight me again at Colony 6 or whatever, and hopefully we can kill each other then. And it takes off with Juju. On the way to Colony 6, the gang passes through an underground mineshaft where they meet the colony's leader. Shulk has another vision of him dying, and is like, Maybe I should tell them about this? Mm, nah. 
Then Gandhi runs off to go defend his colony all by himself, and Shulk finally decides to tell the others about his visions. And together, using the power of friendship, they manage to change fate and save everyone. Well, everyone who's important to the plot. The actual villagers of Colony 6 were already eaten by Mechons by the time they got there. Maybe shouldn't have spent all that time grinding side quests. Whoops. Outside of Colony 6, they're met with a whole gaggle of faced Mechon, including that one from the beginning of the game, who is like, Hey Shulk, remember when I totally killed your girlfriend? And Shulk goes, ah! But the Monado doesn't do anything. And then Dumban and Dixon show up and they're like, ah! But they don't do anything either. Nobody does anything. So eventually everyone just leaves. Dunban officially joins the party and they continue up the Bionis to a forest growing on its back. Don't ask me how it's all not falling into the ocean, gravity just doesn't exist in this game, I guess. A cutscene plays where we see a bird lady fighting against a crystally dragon. She fires a giant pea laser and manages to scare it off. Meanwhile, Shulk is also starting to have visions about visiting an old giant chained up at the peak of a tower. And that same bird lady is also in those visions, so we know she's going to join the party. Hey, thanks for the spoilers, stupid Monado. They soon find the bird lady passed out somewhere in the jungle. And Sharla's like, okay guys, this is gonna sound crazy, but I need to shoot her with my really, really big gun. And it's gonna bring her back to life but I need these specific ether crystals that are found somewhere in the jungle. So Shulk searches around for the crystals and ends up finding a mysterious silver-haired anime boy along the way. Hi, I'm the Komida character and I'm gonna give a bunch of vague details about the plot that implies that I know more than I let on. Then some Telethia appear and Shulk tries to fight them, but his visions aren't working against them for some reason. No, you gotta use this new Monado power that dulls their perception, but you have to refresh it every six seconds because it times out very quickly. Wow, that sounds like it really breaks the flow of battle and will get annoying super super fast. It does. So Shulk manages to beat up the Telethia and brings a crystal back to Sharla, who shoots the bird girl with her 50 caliber, bringing her back to life. After a quick talk, the bird lady, whose name is Melia, explains that Shulk's visions are probably about a place called Prison Island. But to get to Prison Island, they have to pass through Aerith Sea, which can only be accessed through a portal in the nearby Napan village. It's here that they meet a Napan named Ricky, who owes so much money to the local government that the citizens make the party take him with them. That's not even a joke, that's literally what happens. At Aerith Sea, they reach Alchemoth, a floating island in the sky inhabited by bird people. And it's revealed that Melia is actually their princess, but her wings aren't as big as the other Hyantia because of her mixed blood. So they just kind of dangle there, all sad-like. Melia meets with her father, who's like, Congratulations on beating the Telethia. I've decided to make you the next emperor. Or is it empress? And her half-sister is like, Nuh-uh, she's not even pure-blooded. Her wings can't even fly. They just dangle there, all sad-like. How about we send her on a solo mission into the Hyantia Temple? That definitely won't be a trap set up to kill her, says the totally not evil lady. So Melia travels to the tomb all alone, and surprise, her half-sister is waiting there to kill her. <laughs> but... Shulk and friends save the day, so I guess it was pointless in the end. Melia gets sworn in as the next Empress, and Alvis has a secret meeting with the current Emperor, where he shows him a vision of him totally getting wrecked on Prison Island. Oh, I mean, uh, Prison Island. Yeah, and Alvis can show people visions because that's just one of the many perks of being a mysterious silver-haired anime boy. Suddenly, the Mechons start invading Alchemoth, and the Emperor is like, Hurry, let's go to that place where I'm supposed to die. So the party follows him to Prison Island, where they meet the giant shown in Shulk's vision. I am the one who created the Monado. Free me from my prison and I shall unleash its true 
power, says Zanza. Okay, says Shulk. Wait, Shulk, maybe there's a reason why my ancestors locked him away for all of eternity. I don't know, just a thought, says Melia. So Shulk releases the giant and gets his Monado enlarged, but suddenly the faced Mechon appear and kill Zanza. Oh, and um, also the Emperor. Using the extra long enhanced Monado, Shulk starts slashing up the Mechon, revealing that one of them is actually piloted by Fiora, and the other one is actually that guy from the intro, and the other guy from the intro is actually Dunban? Uh, oh wait, we already knew that. But Fiora doesn't seem to remember anyone, and so the faced Mechon casually retreat back to the Mechonis. The party makes their way further up the Bionis through a snow-covered mountain where they enter the temple that young Shulk and the Monado were found inside ten years prior. Alvis starts ranting to the party about the intricate details of the Monado and how Aether works, but it's all gonna get retconned in like five minutes when the big twist happens, so I'm not even gonna bother explaining it. Moving across the Makana's sword, they once again encounter Mumkar, who gets his butt kicked by Dunban. However, Shulk stops Dunban before he can kill Mumkar and is like, I don't care if he killed thousands of people from our village and your sister, if you kill him, you'll be just as evil. Wow, that logic really sucks, but you're the protagonist, so I guess I have to believe you. But then a rock falls from the sky and kills him anyways, so I guess it all worked out in the end. At the entrance to the Mechonis, they once again meet Mecha Fiora, and Dunban tries to tell her that if she doesn't stop being evil, she's gonna get grounded. But then the Mechonis leader shows up and he's like, I'm sure you already know by now, but the faced Mechon are all under my control. And I also wiped their memories, so don't try using the power of friendship to bring them back because it's not gonna work. Fiora, you gotta wake up. Remember? Friendship? Hold on, I think I'm starting to remember things. Hey, cut that out. So Fiora turns against Egil and gets yeeted off the Mechonis. And naturally, Shulk does what a sane person would do and dive bombs after her. While the rest of the fortress plummets down to the ocean. Shulk wakes up next to Fiora and is like, Hold on, she's not moving after falling thousands of feet directly onto her spine. I wonder what's wrong with her. I know, she must be thirsty, and gives her some water by kissing, which is kinda gross, but it brings her back to life somehow. So Fiora joins as a permanent party member, and then me, the player, is like, oh cool, let me see how she plays. Never mind. Shulk and Fiora reunite with the rest of the party and enter a village full of surprisingly peaceful Mechon, with their leader being Egil's father, who gives them the mission of killing Egil, which they gladly accept. On their way back up the Mechonis, which is surprisingly easy thanks to all the elevators, they run into Egil's sister, who gives us that sweet, sweet backstory. <clears throat> Long, long, really long ago, the Bionis and the Mechonis lived in peace. The Mechons lived on Mechonis and worshipped Manith, the soul of the Mechonis. And the Giants lived on Bionis and worshipped Zanza, the soul of the Bionis. But both species still made time to chill out and stare off into the sunset. Until one day, Egil's BFF Arglass came into contact with the Monado. Little did he know that Zanza had hidden his soul inside of the Monado and took control of Arglass's body. Zanza, using Arglass's body, then began a war against the Mechonis that would last thousands of years. Egil never forgave this betrayal and swore to take revenge against Zanza and the Bionis. End scene. Oh, and a uh, side note. Egil's sister is also responsible for putting Manus' soul inside of Fiora when she was mechanized, which explains why she has a split personality and also her eyes glow red sometimes. At the Mechonis capital, Shulk confronts Egil, who tries to explain that the Bionis is about to reawaken, and that all life on Bionis will be used as a sacrifice to supply it with ether. And that's the reason why the Mechon were sent to destroy Homs, in order to starve the Bionis from its ether supply. 
but Shulk wasn't really listening and stabs him anyways. So Egil gets mad and reawakens the Makanis. They fight again at the heart of the Makanis, but this time Shulk decides not to stab him, which helps convince Egil to change his ways and everyone lives happily ever after. Then Dixon shoots Shulk in the heart and Shulk dies. And then another Shulk comes out of Shulk's body. And this Shulk has even longer anime hair. <gasps> Turns out that Zanza was actually inside Shulk the entire time. After he was sealed away on Prison Island, he once again put a part of his soul inside the Monado, which was found by an expedition team, including Shulk and his parents. Zanza sucked away all of their ether, killing them in order to revive himself. He then used Shulk's dead body as a vessel, constantly sending him visions and leading him to the day where he may revive himself at full strength, which is... right now. With his newly awakened body, Zanza has a sick DBZ fight with Maynith Fiora before turning Maynith's soul into a second Monado. And at this point, the party is like, hey, maybe we should grind a bit more before we take on a god. Let's bounce. So they escape on their ship just before Egil and the Makanis get straight up obliterated by the Bionis. As the crew is flying back to the Bionis, Dixon ambushes them with a bunch of Telethia. Thankfully, Melia's brother shows up to defend them. Hey, you forgot to mention me in the video. I'm an important character too. But then he gets turned into a Telethia, along with every single other pure-blooded Hyantia. That's right, it's plot twist time. Again. Turns out that the Telethia are actually the true forms of the Hyantia, that they revert back to when exposed to high amounts of ether. They were originally created by Zanza for the purpose of exterminating all life on Bionis, in order to supply it with enough ether to reawaken. In the second noble sacrifice of the past five minutes, Melia's brother uses the last of his willpower to charge at Dixon, giving the party a chance to escape. They land in Colony 6 and Shulk is placed on life support, barely still alive thanks to... Alvis... doing... something... I don't know, he's a computer and he has cheat codes, we'll, we'll get to it later. Meanwhile, Shulk is floating around inside of his brain, all depressed because he just found out he's been dead for the past 10 years. God, get over it. When suddenly, Alvis shows up inside of Shulk's brain and gives him a vague but inspiring pep talk that manages to break him out of his coma. Shulk returns just in the nick of time to save everyone from Dixon. Dixon pees his pants a little bit and scurries off to Prison Island. Oh god, not again. Prison Island. Island. Prison Island. You get it. The party confronts him again, but this time in his true form as a giant. Fiora is like, Dixon, why are you so evil? And Dixon's like, Oh, I don't know. They never really fleshed out my backstory. So they kill Dixon and Shulk sheds a single manly tear before the whole party is suddenly teleported into the solar system. Okay, I'm sorry. If something doesn't make sense in this explanation, it's probably just because Alvis did it off screen with his computer powers. Because he's a computer and he's also the Bonado and he's also a god and he's... <laughs> so Zanza tries to do the old join me and we shall rule the galaxy thing. But Shulk is having none of that, and so begins the long and difficult final battle. Or at least I assume it was supposed to be. I'd already completed all the side quests and was max level by that point, so it was kinda over in 5 seconds. Hey, it's not my fault that a god has lower stats than the local mountain trolls. So Shulk manages to awaken the third Monado, which is actually Alvis's true form well, besides a computer, and obliterates Zanza once and for all. With God now defeated, Alvis sends Shulk back in time to witness the birth of their universe. That didn't sound crazy at all. <clears throat> long, long, super duper long ago, Zanza and Maynith were originally scientists, performing experiments to create a new universe, using a supercomputer run on the AI known as Alvis. However, an accident caused the destruction of their own universe and the creation of a new one. 
One where Zanza and Maynith were gods, with Alvis kind of overseeing the both of them as like a non-interfering super god. Zanza and Maynith then gave life to all the creatures on the Bionis and the Makanis. However, as these life forms advanced, they began to ponder what lies beyond the, Baga the, ba the Bionis and the Makanis. <laughs> Zanza feared this, because the Bionis requires ether, and being left behind would mean the disruption of the ether cycle, and the death of both the Bionis and Zanza. So he created the Telethia with the purpose of exterminating all life on Bionis, so that he could start over again and again, perpetuating his existence as a god. However, his power was eventually surpassed by a new god. Shulk is then given the option of deciding the fate of their universe, as the wielder of the true Monado. He ultimately decides that the world has no need for gods, and that the future should be decided by all of its people. And so, he tosses away the true Monado, and a new world is born. One without the Bionis and the Makanis, where all life lives together in harmony. And on top of it all, Fiora even has her old body back. The... End. So this is why people say Shulk is canonically the strongest Smash Brothers character. I mean, Mario may be tough, but he never became a god and rewrote the entire universe. Actually, I never really played all the spin-offs, so I could be wrong on that one. So there you have it, the entire story of Xenoblade Chronicles. There's absolutely nothing else we could possibly be leaving out, it's all over. <sighs> Besides the post game. Woo! There's even more. Ah, kill me, please. Okay, okay, okay. The video is already 22 minutes long, and if I spend another week editing it, I think I'm actually gonna go crazy. But I do have a lot of the art made for it, so if this video does well, then I can definitely make a follow up video pretty quickly. And if you have any games that you'd like to see me cover, then leave a comment below telling me what it is. I'm planning on being a lot more consistent with my upload schedule in 2021, so I'm gonna try to bust these things out. Big thanks to my friend Harmonia for drawing the art for major scenes in the video, and Vex for doing the art for the Bionis and the Makanis. If you enjoyed their work, then give them a follow, their links are in the description. You can also follow my Twitter for updates on when videos should be coming out. If you enjoyed the video, then leave a like and a comment and subscribe for more. It'll really help me out in the forbidden YouTube algorithm. And of course, thanks for watching. Hopefully I'll see you next time.